Hi, I'm going to introduce our speaker today. It's Tracy Ambrose, and we're so excited that she's here with us. She is our lead audiologist at Children's National in the Congenital Hearing Program and has done a lot of work with congenital hearing loss from CMV and also Zika. So she's going to share with us today about congenital hearing loss diagnosis and treatment. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> All right, so just to kind of orient ourselves in anatomy and obviously what we're talking about being the, the ear and the um, yeah. <laughs> system here. All right, so um, obviously I think hearing is important, but why I think it's important for all of us to kind of have a good base of knowledge on it. Um, there's a pretty good incidence of hearing loss. About two to three out of every 1,000 babies in the United States are born with congenital sensory neural hearing loss, so permanent hearing loss. Um, by the time children reach school age, an additional three to five out of 1,000 children will be diagnosed with sensory neural hearing loss. And we're a little unclear on if that's because we missed them at birth, um, that we didn't get the, the diagnosis um, from the hearing screenings that we'll talk a little bit more about, um, or if this is, you know, a true um, progressive hearing loss. It's probably a little bit of a mix of both of them. Um, so, um, you know, the, the most intensive period for speech and language and communication development is that first three years of life. Um, and research has shown us that without exposure to communication during that critical time, um, even with intensive therapy afterwards, developing spoken language or even sign language um, and reading skills is very difficult for children um, because those auditory pathways aren't properly formed um, and it's very difficult to go back and, and reverse that. Um, so just to kind of orient us how sound how works, sound works. Um, 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 produces sound the vibration, the vibration of, of the air molecules and, and um, and um, the, and the membrane. membrane. Um, the membrane vibrates those middle ear bones, so the malleus incus and stapes, and goes to the foot plate of the stapes that sits on the oval window, um, and that enters a fluid-filled inner ear cavity. Um, and once that enters that fluid-filled cavity, it turns from a mechanical sound vibration um, to an electrical energy in the cochlea that's transferred to the inner hair cells and off to that auditory hearing nerve. So this is a, a picture of the, the cochlea. Um, so the cochlea is, when you roll it out, um, it is uh, tonotopically arranged. So this is a picture actually with a, a array of a cochlear implant inserted into it, but I like it because it kind of points out exactly where the different pitches are in the, the inner ear. So, um, you know, when we do cochlear implants, we try to match those as much as possible to make it as, as natural of a sound as possible. So um, it goes from the low frequencies on that basal end to the high frequencies on the apex. So what is the apex? Oh, sorry. The Wire silver thing. array, yeah, yeah, yeah. So inside of that, um, hard to see in the pictures, but there are actually three rows of outer hair cells that you can see depicted here, um, and then one row of inner hair cells. So the outer hair cells um, transfer that sound to the inner hair cells, which turn into electrical activity that goes off to the nerve fibers that you can see there. And the nerve fibers are also pitch matched um, for specific different frequencies. All right, so when we're talking about um, diagnostics in hearing, um, you know, obviously we start right from birth. So uh, universal newborn hearing screening is uh, mandated in 43 states currently, plus DC and Puerto Rico. Um, and that started in about 1999 um, with Congress's act that they passed the Newborn Hearing and Infant Screening Intervention Act. Um, 95% of all newborns in the U.S. are screened, so we actually do really pretty well about um, getting a lot of those patients uh, screened. Um, where we fall really short is in follow-up, so those patients that don't pass um, or that are supposed to follow up for risk factors, we lose about 50% of those, so a huge, huge amount there. 
Sure. Um, yeah, it's a cost issue um, because, you know, they have to, in the hospitals, they have to have techs or nurses or someone do it. Um, you also have to get equipment. Audiology equipment's pretty expensive, so. <laughs> um, but you can kind of see them there in the picture where they, the, the states that aren't. Um, so what we call EDI or hearing, early hearing detection and intervention programs um, are, are nationwide and they're the ones that collect the data from the states for us and put out all the, the census kind of information. Um, and they're also really good resources for families um, that are all free. So two different types of screenings that are done in newborns, um, otoacoustic emissions, um, and then the AABR, the automated auditory brain stem response. Um, the OAEs are much faster, so typically that is what's done in the well baby nurseries. Um, it's also not as, not as comprehensive in what it looks at, um, so we call it either DP or TE uh, responses, and it's just kind of how the signal is sent, so it's a distortion product or transient evoked um, otoacoustic emission, um, and that is the, those responses do come from the outer hair cells in the cochlea. Um, and it's just a pass for refer result, so they either get the response or they don't, and typically the equipment for the, the technicians is set up that it just gives them a pass refer. They don't really get the details of it. So the problem with that is that we can uh, miss mild or slight hearing losses. You can still have a present otoacoustic emission and have, um, and have a mild hearing loss, um, pretty much down to a moderate hearing loss. You could have a pretty significant hearing loss and still, still pass this. Um, the AABR is what you'll typically really see in the, the NICUs. Some, um, some places are really trying to do AABRs throughout all of their facilities, um, and the reason is because it really is a good full evaluation of the auditory pathway. It gets us all the way up to the level of the brain stem. Um, that is done at 35 decibels, um, where 20 decibels is normal hearing, so again, we can, we can miss uh, mild and slight hearing losses. Um, but the reason we do it at a slightly higher level is because it's not, you know, it's not done in a sound booth. It's not done anywhere that, that is super quiet. So we give a, a little bit of leeway just by raising the stimulus a little bit. Also, kids are still going to have, you know, the fluid in their ears and, and stuff like that. So we give them a little bit of a pathway so we don't get too many refers on it. Um, and it's actually really pretty good with sensitivity and specificity. So when kids refer on those tests, um, that's when we go to the diagnostic ABR, auditory brainstem response. Um, here, a lot of people call it the BEAR or the brainstem auditory evoked response. Um, I think that's just our, our correlation with Dr. Bayer because usually other people call it ABRs. But anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, you see um, in the depiction there, that's just a regular normal waveform. So we're looking at typically three different waves that I'll show you, and we just follow wave five all the way down to normal hearing, and this would be a threshold ABR. So this is what we're doing in infants um, that aren't passing their hearing screening. Um, besides just the present of that wave five that goes down to, uh, to normal hearing levels, we're also looking at um, the morphology of the waves, the amplitude, the absolute weight latency of those waves, and the inner peak latency, so how far apart they are from each other. Um, and we should have a latency intensity function. You can see it here as the sound decreases, that wave five shifts out. So that's that latency intensity function. Besides, so this is the pathway for, um, for the ABR test. Um, so it goes from the distal portion of the eighth nerve. Um, it goes to the cochlear nucleus. It crosses over where we pick up wave three to the superior olivary complex. Um, and then wave five that we typically pick up, we don't really see wave four a lot. So wave five, we say, is the lateral lemniscus inferior cochlis. Um, and that's where we pick up that response, the so rate right at the level of the brain stem there. Um, besides just thresholds, we can use ABRs for more diagnostic evaluations. Um, so in this ABR, it's what we call retrocochlear pathology. So um, you see that between the two different polarities, so when we go from a refraction to a condensation polarity, um, the, the waveforms flip there. And really what we're getting there is the ringing out of the cochlear response um, and no real neural response at all. So we're not seeing any response from that auditory nerve. Um, 
kids that had this would have, you know, they could have a hypoplastic nerve, they could have an absent nerve, obviously, um, you know, they're, obviously, if there's a, a tumor or something else going on that's cutting off that response, this is what we would see, um, and we use this in adults as well, so. Um, the other thing that we can see is, um, you know, we can kind of do a site of lesion for the evaluation, so in this test, there is a wave one, so the, you can see the peak that's at the, at the beginning there, um, but then there is no wave three or wave five, um, and so that tells us that the auditory nerve is functioning, um, but as we go to the level of the brainstem, the brainstem is not functioning, it's not sending that, that acoustic signal off properly. Um, so what we would call our gold standard of testing is really behavioral evaluations. Um, you know, the ABRs are great, and especially below six months, we really use that. Um, uh, uh, well, we have to use that. We have nothing else. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it doesn't give us that cortical function, as we just talked about. It only goes up to the level of the brainstem. So we really don't know after the brainstem what the child is doing with that sound. We can't prove that they're actually processing it. Um, and that's where the behavioral evaluations come in, because they have to obviously hear the sound. It has to go all the way up to the to the brain and it has to be processed for them to give us that that response back. Um, so it's really the what we're using to get these evaluations on kids are just a conditioned resp response. So a traditional Pavlov's dog where you know we have a stimulus and a reinforcement um, and we pair those until they they understand that those are paired and then we can do the stimulus and wait for um, the response to come. Um, so we use behavioral observation a little bit, that's not as scientific, um, but visual reinforcement, audiometry, conditioned play audiometry, and conventional audiometry, just your regular raising of the hand, um, which we don't have a lot of kids that do that. So um, visual reinforcement audiometry, we start at about six months of age, so when they're developmentally about six months of age, they have to have head control and they have to, you know, be able to localize sound a little bit, and that starts to happen at six months of age, the localization. Um, so they really do have to have head control and be able to at least sit. They can be semi-supported by the parent, but they have to pretty much have a little trunk control as well. Um, so like I said, they're conditioned to view that toy every time there is a sound present. So you can see that, that little kid here, um, when there's a sound, that box lights up, there's a little toy in there, it dances around, there are lights that dance around, and, and it makes it fun to view. Um, and so that response is conditioned, and then we'll just play the, the tone or the, the pitch that we're looking at, and they'll look for that toy. And that's how we know that they heard it, that conditioned response. Um, as kids get if a little- the toy doesn't light up in that situation. Mm -hmm. It lights up once they, so it, it'll be black when, you know, we're not seeing anything, and then once they turn to look for it, then it will light up. So it's not paired um, when we're actually Got getting it. the threshold information. Um, so condition play audiometry, we started about two and a half years of age um, developmentally, um, up to about five years of age, depending on the hyperactivity of the, the child and all of that kind of stuff. So it's basically just playing a game. So same sort of concept. Every time they hear a sound, they're doing a task. Um, you know, they're throwing a block in a bucket, you know, any number of things. We try to, to gear it towards the child so that it's fun um, and that they want to do it. So, and that's how we get the, the condition play audiometry. They have to be, typically once they have some speech, that's when we start doing that. So that's why we say about two and a half years of age, that's when they developmentally are capable of completing that task. And then of course, just the conventional audiometry from there. Um, so just a, a quick review, I'm sure everyone has seen audiograms before, but these are the different pitches and frequencies um, that we're looking at. So um, across the, the x-axis, we're looking at the different pitches, low to high, um, and then the sounds on the y-axis level, very soft to extremely loud. Um, and what we have there, that circular, you can kind of see there, it's what we call the speech banana, because um, it looks like a banana. Um, <laughs> and that is uh, where all the pitches and frequencies of speech lay. So you can see where all of those, those are found on an audiogram. So when kids have different types of hearing loss, this is where you know the speech banana becomes important. Um, so they have a high frequency hearing loss, um, and then you'll notice in their speech that they're missing those F's and those S's and TH's, those finer points of speech. Um, and that's where you get into what we would consider like a deaf speech where it becomes very nasally um, because they aren't, aren't hearing those higher pitches of sound, so they can't articulate them, obviously. Um, 
So just a couple examples of audiograms. So the, the one in the upper right-hand corner here is a pretty comprehensive evaluation, so an older child. Um, so X's are left ear, circles are right ear, um, and we, on our, our audiograms, we have a line where we consider normal hearing. So that thick black line at 20 decibels and everything better than that, so completely normal hearing. We're also looking at speech evaluation. So we're, we're saying a word to the child and having them repeat it back to us. Um, and it's a bisyllabic word um, so that they are able to repeat it back down to the threshold level. And we're looking for the correlation between those two. So you should be able to obviously say speech down to the same level that you're, that you're hearing tones. Um, and so it's that inner test reliability that we're looking for um, to make sure that, that the results are accurate because, you know, kids can fake you out. So <laughs> it's important to be able to have cross recheck. Um, principles there, um, and then some word recognition in there as well, where we're just going in at a soft level, saying the words, and they should be able to repeat them back. Um, and that really gives us that comprehensive um, look at the whole auditory pathway that we know that sound is being completely um, processed and, and put back. Um, and so then in the bottom here, this is just an example where it is not normal hearing. Um, and typically you always have a key with the, um, with the audiograms, um, but you can see here we have mass bone. Um, so little half boxes are actually the left ear there. Um, and the, uh, the other cross marks there are the, just the right ear. So, and that means unmasked. Um, so just the two different evaluations. So when we mask, we know that we're only getting the sound from one ear. Um, but if we don't mask, all we can say is that we're getting it from at least the better ear because that sound is going to um, travel uh, via bone. So, so in that ear, um, it's a mild, or uh, I'm sorry, a moderate low frequency conductive hearing loss. So that would be a kid that has fluid or something. So otoacoustic emissions, um, a little bit more. We really do use these quite a bit in evaluations for congenital hearing loss and hearing loss in general, um, because you know they, they can give us some, some information that the child doesn't have to do anything for. Um, so for kids that aren't really uh, able to do tasks, we can use this testing. Um, I forgot to mention with the ABR testing, you know, we only do it typically below six months because the child has to be completely still for it. Um, and so obviously after six months when they're not really able to, you know, sleep in a strange place for a good at least 30 to 45 minutes, um, then this is where we would use otoacoustic emissions more. Um, ABRs, because we're looking at electrical activity, muscle movement is also obviously electrical activity, so any movement from the child really wipes out the response we're looking for in the ABR. Um, and then we have to look at sedation, um, which obviously we want to we wanna be able to avoid. So this is where the otoacoustic emissions really come in handy for us. Um, and basically we're just using a low level sound um, that is emitted by the probe that you see up in that, that picture there. Um, and then we're reading the response back. Um, and, you know, technically what is happening here is we're looking at that outer hair cell movement. Um, so as we put the sound in, the stereocilia in that outer hair cell are bending back and forth, movement pushes <coughs> that rushes ions in and out of that hair cell, which changes the membrane potential of the hair cell. Um, and then that voltage change is shortening and lengthening or electromotility of that hair cell, um, causing the basilar membrane to vibrate. And that's where we're picking up that OEE response. Um, another area that we really use um, OEEs and that they're very valuable can be for ototoxic monitoring. So kids that are receiving ototoxic medications, these are really important for um, because they can foreshadow threshold shifts. So we see a decrease or an absence. I mean, it's really an otoacoustic emission is really present or absent. So we'll see an absence of those otoacoustic emissions um, before we see it in a threshold shift. So it can kind of foreshadow what's coming for us, and that helps us be able to counsel the parents and, you know, obviously discuss it with the team if, if there are great shifts there happening. So tympanometry, um, something we're looking at it a lot with kids um, because they're, they're chronically having middle ear issues. Um, 
So basically the type A is the completely normal companogram that you see there. Type A sub D would be excessive movement of the eardrum. Um, so if they had a disarticulation of the middle ear bone, something like that, we would see the A sub D. Um, the A sub S means that the, the eardrum is stiff. Um, and so we'll see that when, when fluid is coming on or resolving a little bit. Uh, the type B that goes straight across there, that is the, an indication of, um, depending on the ear canal volume, it's typically an indication of fluid. So if they have tubes, we'll get a type B, but that'll be just telling us that the, the eardrum is opened and that the tubes are working. Um, but if we have a normal ear canal volume with the type B, then we know that there's fluid in that middle ear space. Um, and the type C there is um, more of a eustachian tube dysfunction. So that's just that negative pressure being held in your ears. I'm sure we've all felt that when you go up in an airplane and your ears are changing before they pop, that's that, that eustachian tube dysfunction. That's that pressure built up. Um, and a lot of kids are walking around with that. I, I, you know, whenever it happens to me, it seems very painful and kids just tolerate it so well. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, so uh, another um, tool that we use to look more at um, that we can get a more intensive look into the hearing nerve and how we're functioning up to the brain stem, again, without using that ABR testing and having to sedate kids, is the acoustic reflex. Um, and so this is another thing that we use, um, and we really want to get it on every child um, before, uh, you know, every evaluation. We want to have this at least once. We want to have a present response from this. Um, because you can see from the depiction here how that moves through the pathway. So basically the acoustic reflex is a defensive mechanism that is built into the humans. Um, and that is just for when we hear very loud sounds, the system is working, is working to stiffen that eardrum um, so that the loud sound isn't passed off as much um, and so that the, it wouldn't damage that inner ear. Um, but to get that whole defensive mechanism, again, we have to go up to the brainstem. Um, and we're using the, you know, obviously it's going up the eighth nerve, but it's coming back the, the seventh nerve. Um, and it, it is crossing over the cochlear nucleus, so we can do ipsilateral and contralateral. So it really is a good tool for us to be able to, to look at the auditory pathway again um, and know if something is, is missing or happening there. We can really do a, a site of lesion to find, you know, where there may be an issue. Um, so we really, like I said, we always want to see that at least once um, from a child. Now, if they've if they've passed an AABR, um, then that's the same same information that we're getting. But like I said, we want to make sure that that hearing nerve is is sending information at least up to the brainstem level. So just a little brief etiology. Um, really, this is something that we defer to the the ENT doctors on. So um, you know. The audiologists don't get a whole lot involved in this, but obviously we see it a lot. Um, so as, as far as the syndromic hearing losses, um, you know, obviously big ones for us would be Wardenburg, um, the BOR syndrome, NF2, those are all really pretty, um, pretty significant hearing losses that we're seeing. Um, and then Usher's and, and Pendred syndrome, um, you know, and obviously you can see going down the list here. So. Um, you know, lots of different types of hearing losses that hearing that, um, I'm sorry, lots of different types of syndromes that hearing loss is just one aspect of that, um, which also can be from, you know, non-syndromic. Um, some of these can be syndromic or non-syndromic, like CMV. Um, CMV, we see a, a large, I mean, 20 to 30 percent of childhood hearing loss um, is coming from that, that cytomegalovirus. So, um, that's a pretty significant amount, um, and, and we're still really delving into the research that, um, to figure that out a little bit more. Um, enlarged vestibular aqueduct, um, that's something that we can see on imaging, um, and that will predict uh, progressive hearing loss. So most kids with EVA are going to end up at one point having a cochlear implant because um, hearing is going to go completely out. Um, and then our biggest one that we're seeing just the, what I would say, typical hearing loss, typical congenital sensory neural hearing loss, um, Connexin 26 is a big one for us. Um, so it's, it's autosomal recessive, but, um, you know, a lot of our patients that there's absolutely nothing else going on, um, if they do the genetic testing, we'll find the Connexin 26 issue. 
Um, and then, of course, acquired hearing loss to spend a lot of time um, monitoring kids um, to make sure that the hearing loss isn't isn't progressive. Um, and you know, a lot of things that that can cause this um, that kids are getting when they're staying here, and especially in the NICU, um, even prematurity can be a risk factor for hearing loss. Um, and one of the the bigger ones that we're really monitoring closely would be the meningitis, um, bacterial meningitis. Um, afterwards, if if the kid's um, hearing loss starts to progress, it's actually the ossification of the cochlea. Um, so we have a, a short window to, to be able to do a cochlear implant. Um, and once that cochlea ossifies, we really can't get a cochlear implant in there and then they're, they're deaf and there's nothing we can do about it. So um, those kids we really monitor very closely um, because if, if we get it on the front end and we can get a cochlear implant in there, at least then, then they're able to hear. But like I said, afterwards, it's, it's too late. Um, so the other, and then the other one that we're seeing a lot, um, and there's a lot of research coming out on the World Health Organization has spoken on, is um, damaging noise levels, the noise-induced hearing loss. It's become a big hot topic in audiology um, because, you know, everyone these days is walking around with Bluetooth and iPods in constantly, and we're constantly listening to things, um, and you don't realize how loud you're listening to them. So that's also become a, a big thing that, that we're talking to a lot about. Can I just ask something real quick? Absolutely. And either you or a neonatologist, why does why does ECMO cause hearing loss? Hmm. It's hypopyrrhea. And and on the same note, uh, is it the exchange transfusion or the previous elevated delivery? Yeah. Okay. So, but that implies that when you're severe enough to require, I think those are markers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It can be immediate. Yeah. So we screen them before they mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Or repeat. You know, once we get a hold of them, we pretty much are making the recommendations from there. But we typically do one month, three months, six months, and we follow them every six months until they're about two and a half, till they have speech and language. Um, so um, the reason really for the one month after, you know, if they're screened here in the hospital and then we say we want to do another test at one month, sometimes they're, you know, they're leaving and they're still getting antibiotics. We're not, you know, we're not always capturing them at the very end. Of um, of the full episode and making sure that it's you know completely resolved, um, and so the one month kind of catches those kids that we haven't screened at the very end of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So the I would do three months. three months. So if we yeah, if they're still here in the hospital, then we would follow them at three months. Um and then, you know, six months after that. So yeah, just particularly with the meningitis. Regular, you know, other kids, just the regular risk factors, we're just following them every six months. Yeah. It's just because they're, you know, the risks are so high with the meningitis that we just don't want to miss anyone. We'd rather be a little overly cautious. Um, and we typically do the same thing with CMV. Um, when we know kids have CMV after they're discharged from the hospital, we see them at three months post-op or post -op, three months after after they're discharged because um, because you know we we can't see that progressive hearing loss. So just a little little over caution. Um. So when we're, we're talking about treatment for the congenital sensory neural hearing loss, um, we're really trying to follow what we call a 136 model. Um, and so this is the Joint Commission on Infant Hearing Screenings um, recommendations that obviously a lot of research has gone into. So for children to learn speech and language development and with their peers, we really want them to follow this model. So we want them screened by one month of age, 
we want a, a diagnosis, if they fail that obviously, we want a diagnostic ABR by three months of age, and we really want them fit with amplification and intervention started, so early intervention or whatever um, other speech type of intervention we're gonna do by six months of age. Um, and, and we know that if we hit all of those markers, they can um, and, and do typically follow with their peers. Now obviously, if there's other medical issues going on, we just do the best that we can. Um, as, as far as hitting those markers, but um, you know, in, in a typical situation, that would be our goal. Um, so just a, a few reviews here of different things. So um, these are all different types of hearing aids. Um, so obviously there are a lot of different types. Um, the ones on the left here are ones that you see um, on in the ear in some fashion. So completely in the ear, it's supposed to be more hidden. Um, and you know, in the canal and then in the ear, they get bigger and the hearing loss gets worse. Um, and then on the right side are the, the behind the ear, different types of models. So on kids, you're never gonna see us fit an in the ear type of, of device. Um, and the reason for that is that kids are growing, obviously. <laughs> and every time they grow, we would have to completely recase that hearing aid. It's just not cost effective. Um, and also, you know, choking hazards and all that other kind of stuff. So, um, so the ones that you're going to see us fitting on kids are always going to be the ones on the right, the behind the ear um, models, and that would be what we call the traditional amplification. So there's that ear mold there that they can do fun, cool colors with, um, and then the the device. Um, and quite often we use different clips and things like that to keep them on on the kids to try and make it fun as well. Um, so that's the traditional amplification um, in different types of hearing losses. And, and some kids can have a congenital permanent conductive hearing loss. Um, oftentimes with microtia and atresia, even after they have the surgery, you know, when they're seven or so, um, they can still have a, a conductive overlay to the hearing loss that is permanent. Um, and these are different types of bone conduction hearing aids. So basically we're just using um, that, that mastoid bone to get the sound to the cochlea. Um, so obviously you can have mixed hearing losses, so a little bit of the conductive with a little bit of the sensory neural. Um, you can see those most often in surgical ears. Um, and then a, a kind of controversial topic in audiology is a single-sided deafness, so kids that only have hearing, good hearing in one ear. Um, what we're doing is using bone conduction devices to take the sound from that dead ear and send it, you know, again via bone, um, to that good ear. Um, it's, it's a little controversial, I say, because, um, you know, we're not restoring hearing to that, that dead ear. Um, we're just getting the sound over to the other side, but we're not going to get localization. Um, you know, there's not going to be a time delay, so it really doesn't give a lot of, of benefit in noisy situations and, and situations that these kids are having a lot of difficulty in. Um, so the the makers and the manufacturers of the bone conduction hearing aids have really done an impeccable marketing job in getting audiologists to use these devices, but they're really hard to verify, um, and you know we can't really prove that the kid is benefiting from it. Um, but some kids like it, and you know if they like it and the family really wants to use it, um, we'll use it. But that's that's why I say it's a little contro controversial. Um, the other thing that is up and coming in single-sided deafness is unilateral cochlear implants. Um, they are happening in adults, and they've been happening, um, you know, in Australia, where one of the companies is from, in Europe for a long time. Obviously, they're, they're always ahead of us and stuff. Um, and that is the only true way that we can restore hearing is, is with the cochlear implant. Um, but with kids, uh, there's a big study going on right now at UNC, um, but otherwise, the insurance companies don't approve it. Um, we've, we've fought for a few kids at this point, and it's the true fight to try and get to get it approved. So um, the things that are used in classrooms the most are called FM systems and we, we really like these and they're they're wonderful. Basically it's just a system to take the teacher's voice and directly send it to the child's ear. So it's reducing all the background noise um, and research has shown us that all kids benefit from this. Um, you know, kids with hearing loss have a lot of difficulty in noisy situations, um, but all kids do, you know, just for attention, because with ADHD, they all kids benefit from this. Um, but of course, it's it's a high cost, 
Um, a full, uh, you know, a receiver and a transmitter for this will cost you about $5,000. Insurance does not cover them, um, so we don't see them a lot in private use. Um, but the schools, schools will typically have them. And if they're in a federal, uh, not federal, if they're in a state school, you know, a state-run school, anything, you know, then a, a private school, basically, um, they are mandated to supply these to the kids. So um, another reason that we we tend to use that um, just from from the IDEA Act. They have to use, they have to supply it if they have a hearing loss, and the audiologist recommends it. So how does that work? So the transmitter is that vertical thing in front of the teacher? No. Yes. So that's a sound field one, not as good. Um, you know, the picture on the right, they're trying to point to an ear level device there. So basically on the hearing aid, um, if you see at the bottom there, that silver piece, mm. that's what we call a boot. Um, and that boot is sending the, the information directly to her ear. Um, so that's, you know, the, the receiver. Um, mm. And then the teacher is wearing that cute little Britney Spears microphone there. Um, and that's, you know, that's how it's being transmitted. And they can use that one transmitter can have multiple receivers. So if you have a classroom with multiple kids with hearing loss, you can hook them all up on that same FM signal, um, which reduces costs a little bit for them. But there's, you know, of course, with everything, there's lots of issues with stuff getting broken and, and lost all the time and stuff like that. But they are really, really great systems, and, and we recommend them a lot. But like I said, because insurance does not cover them, um, it's, it's hard for families to purchase them. Um, and then the, the cochlear implant, um, you know, the treatment for the most severe types of hearing loss. Um, and basically, you know, I think we all know that this is a surgical um, type of intervention. So it is a little bit more, well, it's a lot more intensive than just getting a hearing aid. Um, we have to have a trial with a hearing aid. So we have to start with a traditional amplification before we can go to a cochlear implant to prove that the child doesn't benefit enough with the hearing aids. Um, and so then with this, we're just using that, you see the receiver stimulator in there um, with the electrode array that is going inside of the cochlea um, and replacing those outer hair cells or inner hair cells that are, that are missing or broken off. Um, and that's the, the way that we can restore that sound. So it's pretty amazing. So how do they, I'm sorry to keep no, you you, <laughs> but how do they, what path do they take? Is it, do they go, because you see that little thing on the back of the, mm -hmm. uh, back so that's of the, where the microphones are, yeah, and then the transmitter, so basically there's a magnet on each piece, mm -hmm. um, so there's a magnet on the external processor there that's sitting up and that's connecting with the internal receiver stimulator there. And when you say internal, that means it's under the skin. Yeah. That is right. That is right under the skin, um, and then they they drill down and do a cochleostomy um, and insert the electrode array in into that. So, but the magnet portion, and that's where the microchip is under the skin. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, that that internal receiver stimulator just has a little magnet on it, and then the microchip. Um, and the companies are typically using. Sorry. <laughs> uh, excuse, I keep interrupting. Um, no, it's, I just had a, 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 one more slide of talking about the um, candidacy for, for cochlear implants. So um, so we were pretty much done anyway. But, um, you know, candidacy has really expanded, extended with cochlear implants. We're using them more and more now, specifically in kids that have that high-frequency hearing loss I mentioned a little bit before. Um, because with those types of hearing loss, you're still missing a lot of speech. So those kids will have a lot of speech. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we'll have a lot of speech issues. Um, and so we can use a combined system in those kids that uses both the the hearing aid for the, the low pitches that we can still use the natural hearing, and it uses the cochlear implant for those areas where the damage is too great and we can't use a traditional amplification. So we really are having the, the best of both worlds now. Um, this is another thing that was really used, um, really used in adults. Um, and they've had such great success with it. Now we're being able to start using it with kids. Um, and we're doing a really a good amount of these at this point. Um, so these kids will be a little bit older, um, but they will be typically born with a congenital hearing loss that is progressive. Um, and it's typically progressive in those higher pitches and frequencies. And like I said, their speech starts to get affected. And so that's when we go to this. So um, when you look back at that speech banana there, you see kids that, that are missing those pitches, even with amplification on, um, they are now candidates for these new these new hybrid systems. Um, Only down to 12 months then. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
you know, FDA wouldn't say so, but, <laughs> but you know, um, again, for speech and language purposes, that it really, you know, we have to provide the kids with the information to be able to, to, to develop that speech and language and to develop those pathways. And um, so, so yeah, we are, we are doing it. It's, you know, on kids that young, um, it's a little difficult. They may end up wearing the amplification a little bit longer just to really tease out where their speech and language is. So that would be a real team approach with the speech therapist. Um, and determining how well the kids are doing. Do you have more questions on the implant? I'm sorry. No, no. That's yeah, I mean, you know, general surgical risks, of course. Um, the surgery will take about three hours, so it's pretty long. You know, some microsurgeries, so, the, you know, it's pretty pretty long surgery. Um, a lot of times we're doing bilateral as well. So, you know, in, in young babies that are profound, especially, we're always going to do both at the same time because you need two ears. Um, and so, uh, so you know, it's, it is an intensive kind of thing. The, there was a risk and there was incidents, gosh, this might have been as much as 10 years ago now, but um, with meningitis after the surgeries. And so there was a high incidence of meningitis. Um, and so now all kids have to have the, um, the vaccines before being able to get the, the implants. Um, so they added on that. Um, but yeah, that was a while ago. And, and I'm not really sure if we ever teased out what exactly was causing it, if it was one of the implants in particular. Or, um, but of course, after the surgery, the kids are getting antibiotics. And you know, at this point, um, I've never seen, I've, I've worked with implants for 12 years, and I've never seen a kid that got it after the surgery. But there was, you know, you would hear that meningitis would be an additional risk afterwards. Right. Yeah. So the sound, you know, older kids. I just did. I uh, just had a kid yesterday that was uh, 19 that we turned on with the um, with the implant. And what they'll tell you is that it sounds very robotic um, because basically, you know, as we talked about with natural sound, we're using acoustic sound all the way up to the inner hair cells, right? Well, with this. The, the sound is being converted to electrical rate as it crosses the skin. So um, that microchip and in the internal receiver is is converting it to electrical. So it's just a matter of the system getting used to, you know, a totally different way of, of that sound being being sent, that signal being sent. Um, so kids, as you guys know, adjust really quickly to things. The younger you are, the better and the faster that it's going to adjust. I mean, a kid, obviously that is profound, has never heard anything, they don't know any different, it's, it's all natural to them. But as we get older, it's a little bit more difficult to process that sound. Um, and, you know, so with adults, if they've been profound hearing loss their entire life, are they gonna be great candidates for this? No, um, because they're never really gonna adjust to how that sound is, and they're never really gonna be able to use that sound. Um, but, you know, with kids, we're, we're always going to try. Um, but our real goal is before five years of age. I mean, really three is our, our real goal for speech and language. Um, but we will we'll consider it up to five years of age on a kid that is completely profound. Um, you know, the older you get, the more that you're going to need to use sign language as well. So you'll be in more of what we would call a total communication methodology because, you know, the you just can't use all the information from the implant because those pathways have started to to reallocate. So, um, you know, after three, we're really going to tell the parents this isn't going to be, you know, the only method that they can use to communicate. They're going to have to have some sign language in the classroom and things like that. So, um, but below three, I mean, with with good intervention and, you know, of course, we never know if there are other issues going on because we're implanting so young. Um, so if the kid turns out to be autistic, then obviously, you know, their their um, outlook on just being completely verbal or oral is not going to be as good. Um, but, you know, on a completely what we would call vanilla hearing loss, so nothing else but hearing loss, um, these kids have a really great outcome. Um, and it happens pretty quickly. They'll, they'll start developing speech and language within within a few months. Um, so yeah, it happens it happens really quickly for them. So it's it's an amazing yeah amazing thing that we have to offer, um, and we're certainly using it a lot. But it, it's it's not a miracle. You know that's what we tell families. You're not gonna put this in the ear and that's gonna be it and, and everything's gonna be great. You know intensive speech and language therapy is gonna be needed. And and like I said, it also always is gonna depend on what else is happening with the child. If their brain isn't normal, then you know <laughs> we can never really predict. 
predict what we're going to get. So um, at the very least, we'll tell families that, you know, we can guarantee sound awareness. They'll know that sound is present. So some people think for safety reasons, that's good enough. Um, but, you know, what, what they're going to do with that information, um, you know, we had a patient that has some other brain stem issues going on and different things. You know, what they're going to be able to do with that information, I don't really know. Um, but, you know, again, we can tell the family that at least sound awareness is going to be present. Um, and then after that, you know, it really depends on, on the kids and the families. The, the parents are huge predictors, and how much work they put in um, is what the kid is going to get out of it, like with a lot of things, I think. Where, where does the deaf community? Hugely controversial. <laughs> yeah, is that, has that gotten better, gotten worse? Is that um, you know, probably not. Um, the deaf community considers cochlear implants genocide. Um, so they think we're trying to get rid of their culture. So some are very strongly opposed to it. But, yeah, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it gets into deep conversations, yeah. Um, but we also have families. Um, we have a family that is getting implanted tomorrow that has two deaf parents, and the child is deaf, and they're implanting him. Um, and this is their second child that they're implanting. So, um, so we are seeing some of that, which, you know, maybe it is loosening a little bit. Um, but if you went to Gallaudet, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to where? Yeah, Gaida. The deaf school. I was there. There's been an internship there in preschool from mm -hmm. years ago, but that was just like a Oh, gosh, yeah. It was really bad when it first came out. It, yeah. it is getting, I would say, a little bit better, okay. but there are still very, very strong feelings about it. Yeah. And we did, I mean, we, you know, we see kids that come in often with kid, with the parents or have hearing loss or deaf and they're in the deaf community and, you know, they they don't do anything. They don't want to do hearing aids. They don't want to do implants. They just want the child to be sign language. And that's that's perfectly, you know, as long as the child has communication, we're we're on board. Yeah, we're good with side, it. What is the responsibility? Like school support? Yeah, yeah. I think once the family's educated and they know all their options and they know, you know, if they're making an educated decision for their child, it has to be, you know, yeah. you know, but but what we try and reinforce with all these families is that, you know, this is a completely different language that you're learning. So the whole family has to learn it to be able to communicate with this child. So, um, you know, on, on the flip side of that, we have some kids that, that have sign language and mom doesn't know sign language, so they don't communicate. You know, the kid goes to school and can talk and socialize with their friends, but can't really do that with mom um, or, or with anyone in the family. So, um, yeah, it can be some sad situations, too. There are follow-up surgeries that are needed, like when the cochlear implant is placed, it's done. Yeah, I mean, as you know, as far as we can tell, of course, there are failures. They they say there's a a 99.8 percent you know success rate, so that with no failures. The there are three different manufacturers, and they each have their own stats, but basically that's what it is. More than 99 percent um, with with no failures, but there can be failures, and we've had them. You know. If, um, you know, the child hits their head right at that point and they can, you know, do damage to that internal portion, then, of course, we have to go back in and, you know, and replace it. Um, but in, in a normal situation, no, and that's what we would tell families. You know, if, if, if nothing else happens, um, then no, I would never expect to have to. So on that internal microchip, the, the companies are using about not even half of it at this point, um, and the reason for that is because we're able to connect that to a computer and upload any new oh, okay. any new things that have come out. Um, and so the external processors are being replaced about every five years. So new technology is constantly coming out on this stuff. It really is is really technology driven at this point. They have ones that are completely Bluetooth and and all sorts of neat things that that kids and teenagers love. But um, you know to be able to com make that compatible with the internal device, we have to be able to update it, yeah. and that's. They, they leave us a lot of room on the microchip wow. so that then, you know, we can say to a family, conceivably, you're going to have this in your entire life. Um, and, you know, at this point, we have we have people that have been implanted for 50 years, and they're still using their same internal devices. Um, so that's nice. One five, one five years, right? Hmm? Oh, 15. Yes. One five. 